welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and as solo artist, past, present, things to come if we get wind of them. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, which is still in print and you can get it, and got that something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, which is not in print and you can't get it. Uh, and writer for uh, music publications, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and whoever will have me. I am joined by my regular esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. How's it going? Not bad. And Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUV-FM 90.7 in the New York area. Uh, he's been there since 1984, and I can't count that high. So, Darren, how's it going with you? Uh, everything is terrific. Got my hand sanitizer and ready to go. Okay. And we have the pleasure and honor of a special guest this time, uh, who's been a guest here before. It is the superb guitarist Lawrence Juber, uh, who has a new album coming out on, I believe, March 27th. Is that the release date? That's correct. Okay. And it's called The Fab Fourth. It's the fourth of his albums of um, fingerstyle guitar arrangements of Beatles tunes. And hello, Lawrence. Thanks for joining us. Hey. Oh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Okay, so because we have Lawrence here, uh, and Lawrence has you know tons of great stuff to tell us, I'm sure, um, just for this one time, we're going to skip the news, um, other than to mention that Record Store Day has been postponed because of the coronavirus. And we have the new date for that, too. Oh, okay. and it's, what, June something? June 20th. Uh, June, June 20th. June 20th. Mm-hmm. And also... Since we had John Montagna on our show in our last broadcast, the bass player talking about Paul and his bass work, um, we were talking about the concert for Bangladesh Revisited, a wonderful concert from the band Wondrous Stories, and John was going to be in it. It was going to take place on March the 13th, but it has been postponed, and there is a new date, which is May the 8th. That's at the Tilly Center in Brookville, Long Island. All right. Okay, but all that remains to be seen, of course, because now they're talking about this stretching on through the summer, and who knows? So, <laughs> yeah, that's how so, it stands at the moment. So let's put that behind us for the moment, or ahead of us, or wherever it is, and turn our attention to Lawrence. So, Lawrence, you um, you seem to alternate, you know, several non-Beatles albums, and then. A Beatles album, and is it is? Do you have a, a a program that's planned out that way, or is it just that every now and then you feel like getting a bunch of Beatles tunes done? There is no program. It's more when my wife Hope, who motivates all this stuff, says, "I think it's time for another Beatle album," hmm. and you know she produces the record. She was the one who talked me into doing the first one, "LJ Plays the Beatles," some twenty years ago, and um, it's just become kind of like a a progression. I mean, I wasn't intending to do a fourth one, but when she said, I think you should do another one, and here's the title. I mean, the title came first, Uh um, which is a kind of an unusual state of affairs. You know, because the last one was LJ. You know, we did LJ Plays the Beatles, LJ Plays the Beatles Volume 2. LJ Can't Stop Playing the Beatles. (laughs) And I thought, well, we call it LJ Really Can't Stop Playing the Beatles. (laughs) But the Fab Fourth just had, I think, more of a ring to it. You know? uh-huh. Well, you know, they only made about a dozen albums, depending if you count the White Album as two and all that. So you're you're a third of the way there. You think you'll do the entire rest of the catalog, including uh, Revolution I hope, 9? I, I hope not. <laughs> uh, because there's a lot of other stuff that I do, too. Yes, that's um, true. You know, it's really, I mean, with this one, I mean, there were certain tunes that I had not tackled that were kind of just, natural ones to do uh-huh. um, and certain tunes that just really don't lend themselves that well to being done as solo guitar pieces uh-huh. you know there's some that just really kind of there's an, an a particular kind of vibe about the way that they work like across the universe just seemed like a very natural one to do uh-huh. um, 
And there's other tunes. I mean, there were a few on the list that I just I tackled and then thought, you know, this is maybe a bridge too far. I mean, I, at one point I was kind of excited about the idea of within, doing Within You Without You, uh-huh. um, which actually would make, I think, a, a really cool live thing. But it just didn't fit the flow of the album as it was developing. And, you know, so there, there's a number of criteria that come into play. And at the end of the day, you want to present an album or one wants to present an album that has a flow to it, that has kind of an integrated feel to it. Uh-huh. And uh, that's really kind of part of what dictated the choice of repertoire. Uh-huh. Okay. Maybe we'll go around in a circle, a, th- a theoretical circle, since we're all in different places. Um, and why don't I pass you on to Ken and then we'll, then Darren, then back to me. Okay. Thanks, Alan. One major question I want to ask you is I've enjoyed all your your CDs of Beatles songs. How much of your arrangement is all planned in your head as you're recording it? And is there anything that's spontaneous when you play? Uh, yes, both. Um, there is, I mean, certain tunes just require being completely mapped out. So then the recording really is a question of getting right performance. There are other tunes. For example, She's a Woman, there's a lot of improvisation in there. Um, mm. And I think it, you know, it, it varies from one tune to the next how much improv there is versus the set piece. And, for example, I mean, A Day in the Life, there wasn't a lot of room for improvisation. There's some room in a tune like that for flexibility in the way the melody is articulated to be able to... Ha- follow the the rhythm of the lyrics, but still be able to twist things a little bit so that it doesn't. It's not the, exactly the same from one verse to the next. Mm. Um, and that I, I try when there's an opportunity to be a little bit soloistic, bending the melody or embellishing the melody. I'll, I'll certainly take that. And I think that in the progression of these albums, and generally, I think in the progression of my my work as a guitarist over the the course of the last 20 years and specifically with these Beatle arrangements that I've allowed myself more freedom to be improvisational uh, Mm. because that's an aspect of my musicianship that doesn't always get to be exercised. You know, it's uh, one of my favorite things is to strap on an electric guitar and, and jam yeah, uh, which I, I don't get to do often enough, but I've been doing more of recently. And that that kind of you know that the kind of one man jam band thing is not something that I can really do in the context of doing Beatle tunes. But I can take advantage of certain moments to be able to be improvisational. Mm-hmm. And I know from having seen you perform many times that when you are live, you do improvise. You don't sound exactly as the record. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's never the same twice. Um, Mm. I think that's just the nature of it, because also from one audience to the next, the feel changes, you know, different times of day, it changes. Right. I think the the Indian classical musicians have it right with their ragas that have different feelings depending on what what time of day it is, you know. Hmm. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I love about your selection is when you play, when you when you choose a song, that may be lesser known. And um, one song I want to point out in particular is Don't Bother Me. Now, I want to bring that up only because this was the first song that George wrote entirely by himself. And he wrote the song just to prove that he could write a song. And it was more like an exercise to him. And he even was very critical of the song later on, calling it uh, a a miserable little song. (laughs) But... um, (laughs) Apparently, you feel otherwise, and I love your whole take on it, because it almost sounds like with the chords that you're playing, it's, it has more of a jazzy feel to it. Yeah, um, but I think that's kind of a little bit built in to the way that George wrote it. You know, and I, was, I, I remember the, the, when I first saw the, the, Ed, the first Ed Sullivan show, the TV show, that, that I was surprised watching George's left hand how much of his chord work was really based around what one would normally consider to be more jazz guitar voicings rather than 
what John was doing in terms of the, the more straight ahead kind of cowboy courts. <laughs> um, and and uh, when I worked with George you know, way back in the mid 80s, uh, we talked about the fact that he had lessons from a jazz guitar player. So and, and he was very aware of Django Reinhardt and, you know, in the house they would listen to Hoagy Carmichael. And, and that's not that's not vanilla harm- harmony. I mean, there's a there's a sense of. Of, of a, a more advanced kind of, you know, heading into the jazz harmony. And that particular one, I, actually what had happened was um, there was a reception that was held here last year. With, there was a, a festival of handmade films, uh, you know, the, the handmade film catalog. And they, they did this film festival and there was a reception for the opening night. And we had put together a band to play a few George tunes for the, this uh, reception. And it's like Jim Keltner on drums and Greg Fillingaines and Nathan East you know, on piano and bass. And, and the actress Bird York, who'd been in one of the movies, was the singer. And that was one of the songs that I chose that we would do. And we did it kind of, you know, uh, almost like a bossa nova kind of vibe. Um, and I came away from that with really a, a deeper appreciation for that as a, as a composition. And I think that that process also kind of informs the way in which this works, that not just with that song, but with other songs, we're getting into the composition, especially the John Lennon tunes, allowed me to be able to to really kind of get a deeper insight into their compositional process individually. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Don't bother me. The Beatles on recording had a Latin kind of bossa nova vibe. To yeah. It, it, has, anyway. it has, has those claves on there. And it's just, yeah, it's it, it's actually better than George thought it was, I think. <laughs> and what I especially love in listening to this CD is that you bring out the beauty of the melody. And I've always said that, that John, Paul and George are three of the greatest songwriters, especially melodic songwriters. But you make the chords, they kind of stand out so much more, the beauty of each chord. And um, maybe it's because you're strumming chords all the way through sometimes. I especially love how you played I Will. So, oh, um, yeah. you know, that's just something that I notice in your playing. And, you know, there's so much strength in the Beatles music just from the melody alone. And you notice that when you hear instrumental versions of them. And your CD really brings that out. Well, thank you. I think that it's the this nexus of melody, harmony, and guitaristics, how these pieces lay out on the guitar, how I can bring out the melody and support, in most cases, the original harmony, but occasionally I'll throw in some extra changes, some altered changes, just for the variety, and because sometimes it's just where my fingers lead me with that stuff. But um, but getting the texture right is really important. And that, you know, sometimes that's a factor of what guitar tuning I use. You know, like I will, for example, is in dadgad tuning, D-A-D-G-A-D, um, mm. but in, in the key of G. So I'm not using it like an open tuning. I'm using it as a tool to give me a textural palette to work with that, that opens up, gives it more of an atmospheric kind of feel. And, you know, and, and I Will is a very, that's an atmospheric kind of tune, if you really think about it from a lyrical point of view. Hmm. All right, Darren, let me pass, uh, pass it over to you. Hey, Lawrence. Um, hey, Darren. It's great to talk to you again. I was wondering if there's a song on the new album that you might have attempted in the past, but for some reason it didn't work on earlier F- Beatle efforts, but you kind of had the brainstorm this time out and, and have pre- been able to do a, a, a tune now that you might have thought in the past wouldn't work. Not specifically, although I had in the past played around with an arrangement of Lady Madonna that I was never satisfied with. And, and so I approached that very differently for this album and I think part of my process in terms of going back to the Beatles' own influences, and with Lady Madonna in particular, I went back to the Humphrey Littleton Bad Penny Blues, which was Paul's inspiration for it, which has this glorious barrel house piano uh, intro. And 
which is an interesting record, just as a side note, because it was produced by Joe Meek. And for a, an English jazz record from the mid 50s with this reverb laden muted trumpet on top, it's actually a very cool record. But, but the, um, the real power behind it, that, that driving piano, was really a kind of an important factor. And I, could, I never was quite happy with how it, I was articulating it. And I, even this time around, I went through about three or four different approaches to it before I settled on where I ended up in terms right. of um, the, finding the right tuning. And also referencing, there was a, a guitarist from the Bahamas named Joseph Spence. It was sure. a big, big influence on Ry Kuda. And Joseph Spence has that kind of feel in his playing. And I just kind of took, went to that for a source of inspiration, too. I was quite happy with the way the Lady Madonna turned out. On the other side of the coin, is there a song uh, that maybe you've attempted in the past and maybe you even uh, tried it out for the Fab Fourth that while you were able to come up with an arrangement that worked, it didn't appeal to you in the final form and you decided to put it aside? I believe there was, but without consulting my list, which would right. mean getting getting up from my nice, comfortable bench. Um, <laughs> I couldn't give you a direct answer on that. But, I mean, to be honest, I mean, there are, you know, just let me take it from a slightly different angle. There are many songs that could have come onto this album, but for one reason or another just didn't make the cut. Uh, and it could simply be that I had 16 tunes and that was, you know, I just had to arbitrarily stop. Right. Help would be one, one for example. I think, you know, help is a very cool tune and that, you know, doing that as kind of a slow bluesy thing would have been a lot of fun. Uh, but I just didn't need to go to that space. Um, you know, so sometimes you, you have to just basically draw the line and and even if some favorite might not make it into the, the final shuffle. Very cool. Thank you, Lawrence. You're welcome. Alan. OK, yeah, I'd like, I guess, to pick up uh with what you were talking about with Ken about the harmonies, um, because in, in a lot of them, I noticed, you know, the addition of, uh, you know, jazz, jazz type chords and, uh, and they always seemed really suitable for where they were like, in, you know, back in the USSR a little bit, if, and if I fell, but I think almost, uh, if I were to pick what struck me as the most ambitious thing on the disc, it would have to be in a day in the life because there's so many different things happening in there. Was that a bigger or not as big a challenge as you expected it to be? The challenge really was just memorizing it more than anything else because, <laughs> you know, each verse, each verse is slightly different, just lyrically, you know, and melodically there are slight differences. The biggest musical challenge was how to address the orchestral crescendo. Mm -hmm. And basically when I realized that if I, if I hit an E chord and just run it all the way up the neck to the upper octave, you know, strumming as I went, that that would serve quite well to emulate that without getting into the complexity of an entire orchestra, all making, you know, going from the bottom note to the top note at different speeds. Mm -hmm. So there was no way that I could recreate that in a real world kind of way. But being able to make that move just seemed to do the job. When I was approaching that tune, I realized very early on that it would be a good live tune. It would be a, really a fun one to do live. And, I, and I, I, I think I debuted it at the Chicago Beatle Fest before I recorded it. Because uh -huh. um, I wanted to see just how well it would go over, and it did. And I thought, well, this, you know, this is one for the, uh, definitely one for the album. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. So you've been doing these Beatles arrangements since at least like 1990, I think was the first album. Um, no, and actually, the first album was, was 2000. 2000, um, huh? Yeah, it's, okay. it's been 20 years. I had done a few arrangements earlier than that. I mean, back in the 80s, there was an arrangement of In My Life that ended up on the first album. And also Martha, My Dear, which mm -hmm. was a real finger. I wouldn't even do something like Martha, my dear, now the way that I did it back then, because huh. I did it in like in the original key of E flat, because huh. it, there was like there were two bass notes that I could get in the, the middle section that gave me open strings if I did it in that key. Um, 
I, you know, but but now it's kind of like arthritis on a stick to try and do you know do those <laughs> kind of, those kind of finger busting things. Yeah. Um, but um, but really, it was it was it, I did rain on my mosaic album, which was 1998. Mm -hmm. And that was the point at which Hope said, you know, you really should do a whole album of Beatles. And I said no. And I kept saying no until she insisted that if, you did, if I didn't do it for anybody else, at least she wanted it to drive around in the car. So I said, fine, you produce and I'll, I'll do it. So, mm -hmm. you know, okay. she's really the, pri the prime motivator behind all this. Of course, I deeply appreciate it because it's given me as a kind of a Beatle file. And as a guitarologist, it's given me a lot of insight into it from a musicological and a musical point of view. And just it's a great kind of it's a great form of study, really, to be able to get into granular detail of Beatle records. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, classical guitarists are um, these days you know, really smitten with the Beatles, but also going all the way back to, I think John Williams had done some arrangements in the seventies and, uh, there were some Toro Takamitsu ones. Now there are whole albums by Guren Solskjaer and the guitarist who only uses his uh, first name Milos. I was wondering if, uh, you know, your, your arrangements are very different than all of those. I was wondering though, if you listened to those and sort of digested them, uh, you know, while thinking about doing your own arrangements. No, I did not. I, and I'm not really familiar with them. Mm. Um, I know, I think Carlos Bonell may have done one too. No, I mean, I really, I, I, if I listen to guitar players, it tends to be either electric guitarists or, or players like Django Reinhardt or Oscar Allerman, you know, kind of of, diff, of uh, previous eras. I really don't listen to much in the way of, you know, quote, classical guitar, Spanish classical guitar. Mm -hmm. um, there is a wonderful guitarist out of um, uh, the Czech Republic named Pavel Steidl, mm -hmm. who plays early 19th century guitar music on authentic instruments. And that's... That kind of thing appeals to me. But to be honest, in my philosophy, that the, what we call classical guitar is really kind of filtered through the Segovia paradigm. And I tend to look at the historic, like the, the early 19th century guitar players as fingerstyle guitar players rather than classical guitar players. Interesting. I mean, Giuliani, for example, the Italian guitarist who worked in Vienna, who's considered one of the founding fathers of, of classical guitar, played standing up. Mm -hmm. He didn't play sitting down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I did a, a, a folio last year for Hal Leonard and, and an album that went along with it. The album was called Touchstones. Mm -hmm. uh, the folio was the evolution of um, uh, fingerstyle guitar. And my vision of it is that, you know, playing a guitar or a fretted instrument like the lute with frets and strings and, and using the right hand fingers to play melody and bass and fill in inner parts is a tradition that really goes back to the Renaissance. Uh -huh. And that doing it on steel strings these days is really not that different from doing it on nylon strings. Just, you know, the, 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 the tone is different. And the, the kinds of the kind of instrument that you use. But when you consider, you know, I play my signature model Martin guitar and Martin guitars in the 19th century in America were the gut strung American classical guitar. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the 1920s when Segovia came along that they kind of got booted off, off to the curb <laughs> and, and then got then really got picked up by the um, the bluegrass players and the um, and, you know, country singers and. Event, and then folk singers, and then it kind of evolved over the last 20, 30 years that Martins really, you know, kind of reclaimed their heritage as fingerstyle instrument. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of, I don't think, I don't really think like a classical guitarist. I, I'm a musician who plays the guitar, and I apply my musicianship to it. And there are areas where I'd certainly cross over into what a classical guitar player would do. In particular, for example, on the previous album on, on Can't Stop, And Your Bird Can Sing really laid out on, on the guitar just like it would be like a classical piece. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of these, you, you could say that too. I mean, there's a lot, always a lot of counterpoint going on and, and 
other kinds of you know alternate lines under the melody. It's it's uh, it's it's a very completely filled out score that you come up with. In my intro of you, I neglected to mention that um, you were the lead guitarist in the last and for many people best incarnation of Wings, and. I was wondering if you ever thought of doing an album of Wings arrangements. Um, I did. I did one <laughs> called One Wing. Uh, oh, probably about 2005, about 15 years ago. Oh. Um, that was uh, really How a did I miss that? <laughs> we, we gave him uh, gave him the LJ plays the Beatles, and he said, "Well, what about Wings?" Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, you know, I did a, a batch of post Beatles McCartney tunes, which I essentially were wings tunes, although another day is on there. So that was a little pre wings. Right. Uh, um, um, but yeah, I mean, I put arrow through me and band on the run. In fact, band on the run was getting um, some airplay on, on Sirius on the coffee house channel for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, is that available on your website? I'm just sort of looking through. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. So it's we like, should say to, whole cat- Right, yeah, My we should say to the listeners. Is, is available on um, Apple Music and Amazon and everything. But, you know, I keep a fair stock a, a, at home in my office of, of albums, and people can order them online through my web store and get autographed copies and stuff. Okay, and that is lawrencejuber.com. So, yeah. just for listeners to. Before we move on. Uh... Over to, I'm sorry, I don't mean to uh, cut in. Before we move over to Ken, uh, just to piggyback off all those guitarists you mentioned, Lawrence, I was wondering if you were familiar with the two albums that Al Di Maiola has released of Beatles music. He just put a second one out uh, that's brand new called Across the Universe. Yeah, I, I have it. We, we share the same publicist. So, um, <laughs> oh, okay. Hmm. Michael Jansen, who I've known since um, Wings were on Columbia Records back in the 70s when Back to the Egg came out. <laughs> so... Um, I am familiar with what Al does. I think he's a phenomenal guitar player. I will reserve judgment on on the the um, on his renditions. I think that you know it's everybody has their own approach to this stuff, and I, I just right. I've, I've been a fan of Al's playing since um, since I saw him with um, Return to Forever. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yep. Mm. yep. All right, Ken. Sorry, sorry to jump in there. That's all right. And I also want to say to Alan. You can always hear Lawrence's music on my show. Okay. Because <laughs> I play him quite often. <laughs> okay, well, one wing. well, now I found one wing on the website, so I'll, I'll definitely get that. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, Lawrence, since um, all these albums you've made of Beatle covers have all been on acoustic guitar, did you ever think of doing all Beatles, another album of Beatles, with a full band where you can play electric guitar and then also acoustic if you want? Interesting idea. Uh, my feeling is if I was going to do an electric guitar album or predominantly electric guitar album, it would be more original material, maybe one Beatles song. You know, I'm playing around with, with an electric version of Help, which I mentioned earlier, is kind of a blues. The uh, one thing I have been doing, which is not Beatles, I mean, it's McCartney, is, is doing an instrumental version of My Love. Uh, as an homage to um, to Henry McCulloch, um, yeah. but but I I can't imagine. I mean, I'm not sure I would even do another album of Beatles. I mean, you know, the I think four albums. Well, I thought three albums was enough, and then Hope twisted my arm, and I did the fourth. Um, but um, I'm not sure I would go that far. It's just there's so much else in my so many other musical horizons to kind of work with that it wouldn't necessarily. I wouldn't necessarily want to go there. Mm -hmm. I know. And I love so much of your other music. It says for the Beatle fans who look forward to when you do your own treatment of Beatle songs, I'm sure they want to keep it going. (laughs) So, uh, and and Um, actually I wouldn't mind another album of wing songs, but you know, that's, yeah, that would, I, I don't think I would do that. You know, although, I mean, there's some fun stuff, you know, I never did, for example, I didn't do baby's request which I can regret not doing on, on the One Wing album. Um, mm. but, um, but in general, you know, I mean, there's just... What I have really been enjoying doing is um, I've, I've done a couple of concerts um, in recent times when we recreated, um, you know, various Beatle albums. Um, at the Grammy Museum, we did the White Album last year. A couple of months ago, we did Rubber Soul. 
And those are great fun to do because that's another opportunity to really get into kind of the granular texture of it. I, I was a counselor at the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp last year in LA and we did the Sgt. Pepper album with the campers at the, um, the whiskey with, with Cheap Trick too. And that was a fun project. But for the Rubber Soul album, I actually taught myself to play Norwegian wood on sitar. Wow. And I think my, my burgeoning sitar repertoire is going to be Norwegian wood uh, within you, without you. Uh, certainly painted black is another one for, for that, you know, maybe over under sideways down. You know, the, the, those, that era of 60s English rock records featuring sitar. Right. Huh. Yeah, I'd love yeah it's, to just really, it. it's just really, really hard to get one of those in the overhead on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see some of these shows on the East Coast that you're talking about, all these yeah, specialty ones. Yeah, those, that's really kind of, I mean, those are local things. You know, there's a lot going on locally. Well, there have been. I mean, now, of course, everything is shut down. But I've been playing locally. Uh, my friend Richard T. Bear, who I've known since the late 70s, um, has a band called Route 66 with Denny Sywell playing drums. Right. Uh, and uh, the horn section that was on the Conan show, um, who also played with Kenny Wayne Shepherd. And um, just it's a killer band, uh, you know, 10 piece band. And we've been playing, um, there's a local local venue called the write-off room that we've just been packing the place, you know, once, twice a month. But unfortunately, like everybody's gigs are, you know, have been shelved for the duration right now. So mm. uh, that's, uh, but that's an opportunity, of, you know, for me to, to write, to um, record, to, you know, work on projects. So, well, when all this craziest craziness dies down you know maybe maybe we'll all just uh move to la because <laughs> that's where it's happening <laughs> all right you're, Darren, you're, you're scaring lawrence at the thought of all this going out there <laughs> kind of what, what i see a trend going in this conversation uh number one you, you keep saying no but it sounds as though there's enough material for a fifth beatles album and also I have the title for your second Wings album. It's another wing, um, <laughs> and another another one as we're planning your the rest of your career for you here. An all sitar album. In all seriousness, uh, I was wondering, um, do you have any plans on doing another album of original material? I think we're talking approximately ten years. I think since the last album of all originals uh, uh yeah you're probably out. right yeah the last one that was all originals was wooden horses right right yeah i think that um More than i mean i having now actually having the time to do some writing because you know one of the issues with touring as much as i've been doing is that it's very time consuming and uh, not only the travel end of it but also you know just the the uh, arranging all of this stuff I mean, as much as, you know, having an agent is really helpful, there's still a lot of work that, that goes into planning tours. And I, you know, I manage, I've always managed myself. So, you know, that's, that's always been a responsibility. I've also been deeply involved over the last few years working with Hope on, on some of the theatrical stuff. You know, we have our Brady Bunch musical that we were hoping was going to launch a tour later this year, but that, I think that's going to get pushed back. Right. But, um, you know, but there's just, you know, been a lot of kind of other work. And the, uh, over the uh, course of time, I was also, you know, I produced four Al Stewart records, which were fairly time consuming, too. So right. having the opportunity, having some time to write is, I think, what will give me the space to actually do another album of solo tunes. And, and to be honest, I mean, strictly from a business point of view, you know, doing an album of Beatles means I've got to go on the Harry Fox website and buy all the mechanical licenses and with, mm. with original stuff i don't have to pay anybody else for it <laughs> right. right right are there any other artists um uh, uh, that are not beetle related that you've always thought to yourself you know would be fun to tackle this particular catalog if you ever did another all whomever album uh, well there are. I mean, I did my you know, World on Six Strings album was all Harold Arlen tunes. Um, mm -hmm. I just did an arrangement. Well, on, on Downtown, which was my 
last album, I did two songs right. by Jimmy McHugh, Sunny Side of the Street and um, I Can't Give You Anything But Love, Baby. And I, uh, my friend um, Lee um, is, uh, is Jimmy McHugh's grandson who runs his publishing. And I did, um, I did an arrangement of I'm in the Mood for Love as a special birthday present for Lee. And it, I, I might figure on doing an album of Jimmy McHugh's songs because there's some really great songs in that catalog. But right, at the yeah. same time, you know, just doing one or two. I, I think there's some killer Harry Nilsson stuff to come. Yeah. Mm. Um, but in reality, I mean, right now, it's like some of the arrangements that I'm working on, are, you know, specific. Like, for example, I, I have a new arrangement of Walk, Don't Run, and that song, you know, you associate it with adventures, but it was actually written by Johnny Smith, who's one of the great jazz guitar players. And his version of it was, was interpreted by Chet Atkins. And that's where the ventures got it from, was from Chet Atkins, which uh, on a Beatle uh, reference, the album that that was recorded on, an uh, album called Hi-Fi and Focus, which was from 1957, also includes the Bach Bure in E minor that... <laughs> George and Paul learned, which was what inspired Paul's accompaniment to Blackbird. Um, and we know for sure, we know via Mark Lewison that, um, that George had that record in his collection. Um, so, uh, and it's always fun to find these kind of like these hidden connections between Beatles and, and other artists. Um, but, um, you know, so that's one arrangement that I've been playing around with. And, and I, if, uh, if everything comes back online for concert performances, I've got a couple of jazz gigs lined up in London in early September that I've been working on some repertoire for that, too. So, you know, I, I like to, in fact, I just this, the other day started working on, on a new arrangement of I've Got Rhythm because Gershwin tunes are always very satisfying to do. Um, right, right. So, you know, so, and there's, you know, there, there's, there's tunes. I mean, I mentioned Return to Forever earlier. I've, you know, uh, there's some Chick Corea tunes like Spain that are really Ooh. kind of like standard guitar repertoire stuff that are w really worth kind of wrapping my fingers around. But, but right. I, a lot of my motivation at this point is to explore my own creativity, you know, having over the course of time, written a lot of music that didn't necessarily see the light of day on, on, in the record world. Like uh, I did a, a suite for guitar, acoustic guitar and string quartet that is uh, played on constant rotation in the Magellan's restaurant at Disney Sea in Tokyo. Um, <laughs> I, you, know, I, you know, writing music for theme parks is not something that comes onto the kind of the rock and roll radar, but actually is... It is a pretty satisfying. And then I did, um, I co-composed the score to the Blizzard uh, Entertainment video game Diablo 3, um, which was, you know, a year's worth of compositional work. So, you know, there's that aspect, me as a composer, that um, doesn't always get fully satisfied as strictly in terms of the solo guitar stuff or even ensemble stuff. It's really um, kind of exists in its own parallel universe. You should put a compilation together of a lot of sampling of all of this stuff, other stuff that you've been involved in. I could, but that means, you know, licensing stuff from yeah, other people. And, it's, you know, again, the motivation from a business point of view is, is writing my own stuff. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, there's certain things I've done. For example, I mean, my arrangement of um, Stand By Me, uh, which got used in a, a diamond commercial. You know, stuff like that, that uh, I'll do it. I mean, I, I didn't even intend to put out a recording of that. It was actually done for a, a folio that I did for Hal Leonard of arrangements of pop songs. And my old record company said, oh, you should put out an album. And I kind of said, OK, I'll, you know, I'll put it out. Album, they called it Pop Goes Guitar, not my title. And as it turned out, it was like you know, that particular track got, um, got a lot of attention. And it, it is actually my number one track on Pandora is Stand By Me. And at one point when, the, when that record um, came out and the commercial was running on, on, um, on Apple, as it was then, iTunes, I actually beat out John Lennon and Benny King at one point to be the, the number one version of Stand By Me on their charts. Nice. Huh. For five minutes, you know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's still something. <laughs> 
You know, you mentioned about things being canceled uh, because of the virus and and all of that. We're taping this on March 17th, so it's like still like unfolding, but everything's been canceled in terms of concerts and it's affecting or impacting musicians tremendously. Uh, you know, you hear more about restaurant and bar owners, but um, on the, on the news, but uh, for musicians, this is really a tough thing. And I'm wondering, um, are you going to try and find some other way of getting your things out there online, you know, say concerts or whatever, uh, or are you going to just use the time to, compose or get your pro uh, next projects together? Well, I was actually just trading emails with um, the Lapidases, um, you know, the Beetlefest people uh -huh. today because I'm considering if I can make it work, I would have been doing my, my main stage concert at Beetlefest, or the fest for Beetle fans, excuse me. Right. Um, on the um, on the Saturday, like a week from Saturday, so whatever that date was, the 28th, uh, right about five o'clock Eastern time. So I'm thinking about doing like a that set as a Facebook live stream uh, at that point at that time. That you know, there, I'm looking into opportunities for doing some um, s some streaming concerts from my own studio, and. In fact, you're the beneficiaries of me having set up my, one of my good microphones to be able to talk into as, you know, as an experiment in making sure that I can get the technology working right. I do offer Skype lessons online. And, you know, it's, I, I'm, I'm in a fortunate position that even with all these gigs canceled, I'm still, you know, I, I'm comfortable enough that I don't have to be really panicking about all of this. I mean, for me, it's... It, uh, and, you know, because all of my interviews, you know, the last week or so and continuing are done, you know, via Skype or on the phone uh, or WhatsApp or, you know, whatever the, the appropriate technological is for that. You know, there's certainly opportunities. And of course, you know, nowadays the, the primary source of, of revenue from recorded music is really in the streaming universe. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I, that and, and serious, you know, it's... Um, I'd say there is revenue to, to come from that. I mean, even YouTube generates a little bit of money. So, you know, that now becomes, I think, more of a focus. I had been intending to cut back on touring anyway. <laughs> now having grandkids, you know, I figure that I you know, want to spend time with my grandkids. Of course, now, you know, we're not able to actually be face to face. So there's a lot of FaceTime going on with that. But I think that you know, it's just uh, repositioning in order to be able to take advantage of the technology. And if it means doing online concerts, you know, streaming, uh, whatever the platform is, then that's certainly a viable option. You know, I miss the feedback from the audience, obviously. And, and I'm, I imagine that things will start to return to some kind of normalcy uh, before too long. But it's just right now, everything is kind of on hold yeah yeah okay um i i know the new album isn't even out yet but have you already uh started on whatever your next project is going to be and anything you can tell us about where you're heading next not really because you never i i you know i i, I don't like to predict this album is just about to come out you know i typically to be doing one a year Mm -hmm. So I probably won't know until later in the year what what's going to pan out. I do have a fair library of live recordings. Uh, there's one particular venue that I've played every year in Washington, Virginia, not Washington, D.C., but Washington, Virginia, which is in Rappahannock County. It's about an hour and a half southwest of D.C. And there's a lovely theater there that I have played an annual concert there probably for the last if not 20 years, at least 15 years. And I have a, quite a large library of live recordings from that that I have some motivation to release. But when it comes to new stuff, I've got some new compositions that are floating around. They may end up being recorded on electric guitar. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I definitely think that from a, from a sonic point of view that I would like to record, do some recording with a rhythm section. Who that would be often depends on availability. 
and where I would record, you know, I mean, I like recording at Capitol. That's uh, kind of a second home for me because it's local and I've done so many sessions there over the years for, you know, especially for TV shows, but for records, I've recorded a number of my albums there. Uh, in fact, the downtown album was recorded in one five hour session uh -huh. at Capitol with Al Schmidt engineering. Huh. And that's, you know, that that's something of a that, that was a, a fun project because I spent a year and a half doing arrangements and then five hours of recording, <laughs> um, which is very different from from the Fab Fourth, which was really recorded over a six month period where I would do a couple of arrangements and record them and then be working on stuff and record something. And then now that's not working. Let me try it again. And, you know, that that way I could really kind of test things out in my own environment. Okay, so over to Ken. Yeah, I have a, a, a few Wings questions I wanted to bring up. In the last few weeks, I've been listening back uh, to the bootleg of Last Flight, which is a tremendous live show from Wings from the uh, 79 tour in Glasgow. And it's pretty interesting to think, when I'm looking at the set list, that other than Yesterday, Ben on the Run, and Maybe I'm Amazed... All the songs that were picked for that tour were entirely different from the Wings Over America tour. So uh, my question to you, Lawrence, would be other than the Back to the Egg material, which, you know, we'd all expect the band to do. Did the band have an influence on what was chosen or was it all Paul's decision? To be honest, I don't really remember. I think that Paul pretty much came up with the set list. I think one of the reasons we did uh, got to get you into my life was because of the Earth, Wind and Fire version oh. that was out. You know, in fact, there was even you know that last little lick, the ba ba da da ba da da at the end uh, mm. that we did was kind of a tip of the hat to the Earth, Wind and Fire one. You know, so and that was a, that was quite kind of quite a stirring opener for the show. Uh, yeah, I I mean we had rehearsed with a little luck, but it just didn't really work as a live piece. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, and we were adding, I know we added for Japan, we were adding another day because that had been a big hit there and let them in. I don't remember what else. We, I think we rehearsed some other stuff, but um, those were the ones that kind of spring to mind. But I think, you know, and it may have been Paul's motivation to do something that was quite different. I think that he also, you know, leaning on the back to the egg material because that was this, that was the band. Mm -hmm. that we played it. And we did, um, we did, I'd ha I've had enough because we'd all kind of learned it, you know, to play for the video when we filmed the video of that. But, but beyond that, I'm not quite sure what motivated the choices. I just heard that there is actually a board tape of the Manchester concert. Which I'm hoping <coughs> to get. Oh. Uh, I haven't that, run that into is, that. That's what, I, that's what I've been told. Now, I didn't know one existed, but the, um, you know, the, the Glasgow one, I mean, that was kind of the peak of the tour. I mean, that was the last, last night of the tour, and that was recorded on, you know, 24 track, and Jeff Emmerich engineered it. I was actually really shocked when I realized, when I looked at the timeline, that Paul was in the studio. With, they started mixing that less than a week after Paul got out of jail in Japan. Hmm. Hmm. Talk about, you know, workaholic. <laughs> so there were plans to put out a live album then? It was, I think he had that in mind because I, I, it may have simply have been because he owed, you know, I think he had a three album deal with Columbia and he owed them, uh, it was owing them another album. So that might have been the thought. It was, um, I just don't know. But I do know that, you know, that one would hope when, uh, you know, in that dis far distant day in the future when the Back to the Egg set comes out, that, that that live Glasgow show, the last flight show, would be part of the package. That would be I great. Hope very soon in the future. <laughs> yeah, not too far in the future. But I have to tell you, I mean, just to interject something, we, you know, now that we are kind of shut in or sequestered is my... Um, my my term for it. We've been catching up on some of the you know, some of the TV shows, and we've been watching High Fidelity, the the Zoe Kravitz show, and the second episode revolves around her putting together a playlist, and one of the tunes on the playlist is Arrow Through Me. Mm -hmm. 
Nice. And I mentioned this to my daughter, Ilse, who's a songwriter. And she said, you have no idea that at least three times a week she walks into a writing session and that song is referenced. That, and, and this happened recently also. She had co-written uh, with Jeff Basker and Harry Styles a song called Treat People With Kindness. It's on Harry Styles' album. And, you know, Harry Styles' favorite is a big Wings fan and his favorite Wings album is Back to the Egg which might have had some bearing on the fact that I got called in to play guitar on, the, on that record. So <laughs> first, my f- first number one album I played on in about 25 years. Hmm. Um, and and all, this, all, the, all the more sweeter because the song was co-written by my daughter. So. Yeah, but it, just, and- it does go to show that, that, that that album, and in particular Arrow Through Me, has, continues to have a resonance, that it's not, it, it, it isn't really dated. And, and I got sent a, a, a video of a, an appearance that Wings, an interview that Wings had done on um, Tyne T's television, which was like Newcastle area during the, during the, the 79 tour. And they had incorporated into this interview, they had Good Night Tonight and they had Old Siamsa and Arrow Through Me in there. And I was really surprised, you know, watching the video for Old Siamsa and listening to it, just how fresh that still sounds. Mm-hmm. You know, and the unfortunate thing was that it kind of collided with my Sharona, um, uh, you know, when it when it when the when it came out, and um, I don't think it necessarily. I, I think that whole album didn't quite get a fair shake because of the timing. You know, the fact that the record business, came, well, the the entire American economy hit a recession right around the time it was released, and there was a whole set of unrealistic expectations of what what albums were actually going to be selling at that point because of what happened with Rumors and Saturday Night Live, um, or rather Saturday Night Fever. It, it kind of, you know, and Rolling Stone gave it a kind of a crummy review. And then over the course of time, it's really been kind of reevaluated. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it's gratifying the fact that it was a good band, it was a good album, and it, it still has some relevance. I think that yeah. Paul was like right on the edge of something really new and really creative with that album, and it, it's it's just sort of a pity that Wings didn't continue and 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 work further, you know, beyond what you had already done on that. When was it clear to you that there was not going to be a Wings anymore? Well, when I think the process of when we were working on the tug of war material. And we weren't in the studio doing it. We were in a rehearsal hall. Mm-hmm. And it was really difficult to really provide the right kind of texture, at least from a guitarist point of view, to create the right kind of texture with these songs because we were really, we were a rock band that was working on pop material and not in an environment where we could adapt and use our versatility in its most effective way. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just became evident as the material was starting to unfold that it was it was not rock and roll material. And, you know, there were a few songs floating around that, you know, I mean, like No Values, for example, which ended up in the Broad Street soundtrack, was, was a song that Paul had uh, introduced us to, which I thought was really a killer song. I mean, you know, he, he said, I dreamt a Rolling Stones song, but it never it didn't do it that way when he got to doing it for the movie. And. I just think that, you know, in that process, you know, and when, when we were kind of like, you know, not kind of uninvited to go to Montserrat to perform, that it was clear that they were just, and, and especially after John, John died, that it was, it was clear that there was no motivation to be being a touring rock and roll band, hmm. um, that there was not going to be a repeat of the, the Wings Over America tour, which was really, you know, that, that it was a shame because if we had toured in America as we had intended to in, in the summer of, of 1981, we would have been doing it with a number one record with Coming Up. <laughs> um, and and the, you know, that, that dichotomy between the, the McCartney 2 version of Coming Up and the Glasgow version of Coming Up, where you have, you know, this kind of, quirky techno version that Paul did on his own versus this kind of dance rock record that, you know, rightfully went to number one. Um, clearly there was, there was a, there were, there were two different paths, diverging paths. And, and during that period, I was busy kind of 
securing my connections in New York with the intention of moving out to New York. And as soon as we were done with the cold cut sessions um, in January of 81, I was out of there. Uh-huh. And I moved to New York. By the way, I misspoke. I said that we would have toured in 1981. It was 19, summer of 1980 that we would have toured. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, do you recall, uh, Lawrence, what uh, the, the final session or sessions entailed uh, in January 81? Um, I know you mentioned old cuts, uh, but do you remember like specific tracks and the end of the, of, of the final session and what the what was in the atmosphere in the air at the time uh, um, amongst the members well we would you know we weren't working on anything new there i remember we we worked on i put guitar on a love for you um mm-hmm. we i remember paul doing a new vocal on water spout and i remember there was a, a remix of same time next year I don't remember much else about those sessions, but clearly, I mean, kind of that was, you know, that was the end of the road for me and Steve. Um, Denny hung in there for a few more months, mm-hmm. um, but it, that was, um, you know, it, uh, and to be honest, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't know how much I would have really contributed to tug of war if I'd hung around. It was pretty much at that point, from my perspective, it was done. My my sadness was that the day that I went to Air Studios to say goodbye to them, I was leaving that evening for New York, and I got a phone call at the studio from Tony Visconti asking me to work on a Mary Hopkin album, and I couldn't do it because I was heading over to New York. And I, this, it, sadly, I, that was the second time that I had to turn Tony down because the first time he had asked me to work on a Rick Wakeman album in Switzerland over over New Year's 1978 to 79. And I had gone to Paul and said, do you mind if I do this? It's not going to interfere with our wing sessions. And he said, yeah, it's fine. And then the next day he changed his mind because he didn't want me to be seen as being a studio musician. He was really wanted wings to be perceived as to being an integrated band. Hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. All right. So when you say that you had already planned to move to New York, did you actually physically leave Wings before there was an an official announcement? Well, I mean, the the official leave date was was, uh, April 27th, which was the date that Denny left. It was really, I mean, at that point, I was no longer on a, um, I was no longer under contract in, in January. I was, you know, basically being paid on a monthly basis. So, you know, Wings kind of folded, you know, kind of, you know, or they didn't go out with a bang. They went out with a whimper. It really just kind of just kind of wound down. So there wasn't a state for me it was really the end of January when I, I decided that I was I was on my way to New York. I mean, I still could have been commuting from New York to London, which I had been doing somewhat as I was establishing some base for myself in New York over the previous few months. So it would not have been difficult for me to go back to London to work with them. But mm. it just did there was no work to do because George Martin was producing Tug of War and, and they had just been using, you know, different session players. Right. It just seems I, like the wings the, the dissolution of wings seems a little bit more complicated to me. Only because well you just said that um after John died, it was what would be the purpose of continuing with a with a touring band. And yet I know that when I've spoken to you before, probably the last interview I did with you, Lawrence, there I've heard that George Martin didn't want Tug of War to be a Wings album. So That's he correct. was somewhat of an influence on that. Yeah, I mean, that, that was the thing. was you know, So there was no touring to do. There was an album being made that was not a Wings album. So what was there to do? You know, there was no, other than the, the cold cut sessions, there was no Wings activity, and it didn't look like there would be. And, of course, there wasn't. I mean, it was, it was done at that point. So that was really, I mean, between those two factors, there was no reason to be hanging around waiting for something to happen. You know, mm-hmm. and I, I mean, I was confident that, that Paul had confidence in me from the perspective that he had me co- go with him in, you know, July of 1980. We went to the south of France to work on the Stop and Smell the, Ro- Stop and Smell the Roses album with Ringo. Um, um, so, you know, but it was just, hey, you know, there's, there's nothing going on at this point. Right. 
Do you ever feel like during those sessions in 1980 that, you know, Paul was kind of losing interest or going through the motions with the band? Was there ever that sense at all? Or, you know, up till even the, the um, you know, through the 79 tour, he still really was committed to Wings. Yeah, I mean, the commitment was certainly there. I think Linda was starting to just feel like it was getting to be too much because, you know, with the four kids, uh, you know, there was just, she had her hands full. Mm. Um, and, and of course, you know, the Japanese bus really kind of shook them up. Um, sure. So that was, I think that was the beginning of the end, really, was, was what happened in Japan. Uh, but it's a really hard to quantify because I can't get inside their thought process. I know, you know, that there was tensions had been developing between certainly, you know, with Jojo, you know, with with Denny's wife, Jojo and Linda never really got along. You know, I think that it, I think it just had run its course. And I yeah. remember I remember when we were doing Campuchia. And I was on the phone right before the concert with Lou O'Neill had called from New York and was interviewing me. And, you know, everybody he said, everybody's in New, in New York. It's all excited because maybe there's going to be, you know, a Beatle reunion for this or something. And I said, that's not going to happen. What you want to focus on is the fact that you've got all these amazing bands performing that are, you know, the 80s bands. That this is kind of the end of the 70s. And you've got the you had these amazing bands like the pretenders and you had elvis costello and and how the it was a change of era you know that we were going from the the 70s into the 80s and the music was changing and and it was you know wings were part of the old guard really so i think that it was just a natural transition that was happening and, and i'm just happy that i i got to to be in that last incarnation of wings because i think we did some good work and and it's and it, it's enjoying. Sure. <laughs> well, what I was, what I was, I actually had a recol, a, a recollection when Lauren mentioned Wings being kind of the official end of the group in April of uh, '81. You know, I've often talked about in past shows here uh, how I was, I had just turned five when McCartney went public that he was leaving the Beatles in '70. So the Beatle breakup didn't really have much of any impact on me. But it was when the end came for Wings that it was like my my world fell apart. And I still remember I was in high school at the time and we were at some sort of, um, I don't know, like a seminar, not a seminar, uh, some sort of um, assembly, rather. Uh, and it was kind of quiet. We were, The whole school was kind of sitting in, or at least my class was sitting in this uh, auditorium. And I just paging through the newspaper to find the blurb that Denny Lane had left wings and it just, uh, and that would be the end of the band. And I think I, some sort of out loud gasp or um, reaction that was audible throughout the entire hall that uh, just because it was like, this was the band I grew up listening to. They were the soundtrack to my youth was wings. And, you know, Denny Lane's not supposed to leave wings. And, um, you know, so when you mentioned that, uh, that date in April, 81 Lawrence it was like the flashback to that loud gas in the in the uh yeah. in the assembly uh well what, that, what that was, was interesting I don't know if it's what I was going to say is I mean the irony was that the April 27th was the official breakup date I met Hope on April 28th <laughs> well <laughs> you know, my life changed Perfect completely segment. so you know I right, always think right. of, even though I'd kind of left and I was in you know already in New York I really kind of ascri- subscribe to that April 27th date because at that point, you know, without Denny, there would be no wings. You know, so right. whereas I could have held out hope that Paul would turn around and say, hey, you know, this, I got some gigs I want to do or, or something like that. The reality was by when Denny left, that was it. Um, right. So, and, you know, life goes on. And, and you know, the fact is that the, my universe changed completely and utterly in the space of a nanosecond on April 28th, um, <laughs> much as it did in April of 78 when, um, when I got invited to join the band, you know, which right. was, I think it was something like April 21st. But I always think it's, it's, it's funny because I, I play periodically, I play at the, the Pizza Express Jazz Club in Dean Street in London. And if you're sitting on the stage, 
if you facing the stage, if you were to knock a hole through the wall, you'd be in the basement of one Soho Square, <laughs> which is where, which is where, MPL which is. is where I, Steve and I did the audition, you know, to join the band. <laughs> so it's always, you know, kind of being in that area is always kind of like reminds me of that that particular moment. <laughs> nice. Hmm. All right, I'd like to just ask a question uh, regarding, and this is a hot topic in, in forums on the Beatles, when it comes to McCartney picking his own material. And in recent years, a lot of people have commented how Paul may not be the best judge of his own material, and he leaves some of his best material as B-sides or bonus tracks and all that. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are wondering why Cage was left off of Back to the Egg. Because a lot of people think it's, you know, an outstanding song. Did you or the band members even talk about what made the album? Because I remember the last time I interviewed Denny Sywell, he was telling me that for Red Rose Speedway, the band actually chose the material. So I'm wondering if there was that kind of involvement from the band for Back to the Egg. Uh, well, I know we we discussed the um, the sequence of the album. But, you know, remember, Chris Thomas was involved in that, too. I'm not sure why Cage was left off. My opinion is that if the, that middle section, you know, kind of the mid-tempo, more traditional Wings-type song had been fleshed out as a complete song, it probably would have been a hit single. But because, you know, the, the other sections that were in there, you know, that punky kind of um, riff that it opens up with and then the weird calliope thing that we recorded blowing, you know, blowing over whiskey bottles and getting progressively drunker as we did it. Um, that was, you know, we put a fair amount of work into Cage. It was almost like our not guilty when it came to you know, spending a lot of time on something that ended up not on the album. And, you know, it's, it's certainly a, it's a, a very viable outtake. I think it just didn't quite, wasn't fully satisfying in the end. And that's always a criterion is, you know, does it fit? Do you feel like it's finished? And I remember one particular afternoon when we were at the castle, when a fair amount of time was spent recording the horn on Paul's Rolls Royce, because they wanted that kind of horn sound. And the, it ended up, we did it on a mini moke. But, um, but <laughs> I remember they were mic miking up his Rolls Royce, which was an, an interesting thing. <laughs> That's the horns that you hear right before the last verse, right? Well, there's that ba doop ba -do kind of sound that. Um, um, okay. You know that that was. I think that's where they were trying to put it in. Because nowadays you could, you know, you could sample it and then manipulate it. But in those days, it was, you know, recording it on tape. I think you know Chris Thomas having you know, having his Pink Floyd experience probably uh, was part of the, part of that process. Okay. Maybe it'll be on the deluxe edition. One would hope so. I mean, it should be, you know. I mean, the other outtake from that, those sessions was, was my tune, Maisie, that Maisie, we recorded yeah. in Scotland. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, there was, um, there's a version of, a mix of that on my Standard Time uh, digital release. Mm -hmm. Right. Wasn't Robber's Ball also recorded during? No. Back to the no, Robber's Ball was later. That was around the time that we were back at the castle doing uh, the videos for Back to the Egg. And uh, Robber's Ball, actually what happened was I got there early, Paul showed up, it was just the two of us. He sat down at the drums and we started jamming. And then we took that jam and then when everybody else showed up, built the song around it. So, and then the other tune that we recorded in that, at that time was also um, Weep for Love, Dennis' tune. Mm. But this was already, you know, Back to the Egg was done when those tunes were recorded. Okay. Robber's Ball is one wacky tune, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it is, yeah, it's totally wacky. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I like about it. And Weep for Love is really an excellent song. Oh, it's, yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. Um, you know, and Denny put that on his Japanese Tears album. Right. Uh, but it was essentially, it was really, it was a Wings track because we were all involved in it. <laughs> okay. Alan, back to you. So when Paul was busted in Japan, 
um, you were actually quite close to him, and um, <laughs> I've, uh, yeah, and, and I think it was about six inches. <laughs> yeah, and uh, what I'm actually sort of interested in isn't so much his reaction, which is probably you know what we would guess, but the Japanese border patrol guy who opened his suitcase. I mean, the Beatles were huge in Japan, and if this was a guy, you know, within a certain age range, he would have known who Paul was and he'd have been thinking, wow, I'm getting to check in Paul McCartney and opens the suitcase and, oh man, really? Thanks so much. You know, was, yeah, was there... I think, yeah, I think you're looking at it a little bit from an American perspective because my recollection is that, you know, it was just a regular customs inspector. I don't think that he necessarily saw Paul as being anybody out of the ordinary. Ah, um, so he was and, just and, sort of stony know, he faced. Registered, he registered surprise when he found, you know, this baggie, you know, with an ounce of grass in it, but it was not, it wasn't like, you know, when I, you know, on occasion when I'd come into, um, when I crossed the border, you know, one, one time I was coming in from, I have coming into New York from, into Kennedy from London, I think it was. And the, the immigration guy looks at my passport and, you know, turned out to be a Wings fan. Or not so long ago, I was driving over the border from Canada early one morning with my guitar on the back seat, and the Canadian Border Patrol guy looks at my passport, looks at my guitar on the back seat, and it's taking a little longer than it should have, and I'm starting to worry, and then he looks at me and says, so are you still playing with Paul? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, but... You have a little bit of anxiety in terms of um, you know, dealing with authority figures at airports. So, right, um, right. That's a, a legacy of that experience. Hmm. In any case, it, it's, been, it's been lovely talking with you all. Um, I think it's time to start thinking about getting dinner ready here. Okay. Um, but, um, and um, uh, hopefully we will, we will, before too long, get to um, you know, regroup at a, at a fest or something. So thanks, Lawrence. That was a really enlightening, informative interview. And uh, why don't we give our contact information before we go? Uh, start with you, Lawrence. Um, give us some information about the new album, too. Yeah, so uh, the new album is the Fab Fourth, my fourth album of Beatles. Uh, you can find it on, well, it comes out on the 27th. Um, you can pre-order on Apple Music and get uh, the uh, instant download of um, Across the Universe. You can find it on uh, YouTube, on um, Pandora, on Spotify, and whatever whatever else is out there. I think you should be able to get some high-resolution files uh, pretty soon, too. We did high-res files of, the, um, of LJ Can't Stop Playing the Beatles, and um, I'm pretty sure that my distributor is able to get the, the high res stuff out there. It's always nice when you can listen on a high resolution because you really, you're pretty much getting exactly what it is that I recorded, uh -huh. um, which gives you just more dimension. So, um, but thank you very much for having me and, uh, everybody stay well. Okay. And thank you, you so and thanks for coming. Well. All right then. Cheers guys. Okay. okay. Bye okay. Lawrence. Okay. Bye, bye bye. Okay. And Darren, you want to give yours? Yes, um, you could send me an email at WFUV. The email address is Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Or go to Facebook and like my uh, radio page, Darren DeVivo, on WFUV Radio. Uh, and catch me on WFUV Monday through Thursday nights at 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And for the time being, not getting into too much detail, let's just say, Temporarily, I can be heard now Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4 o'clock, and that's Eastern and WFUV's in New York at 90.7 FM uh, and 90.7 FM HD2, plus streaming at WFUV.org and on uh, the WFUV app. Okay, and Ken? All right, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. I have a new prize to give away as part of my Beatles trivia and games page, and that's the new book from Ted Montgomery, and it's called The Paul McCartney Catalog, A Complete Annotated Discography 
of solo works from 1967 through 2019. That's a new prize, one of nine prizes you can win on that page. Uh, don't forget every other Monday night, my other podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. It will be on next Monday, and that will be on March the 24th at 9 p.m. Eastern on our Facebook page for Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. You can join me along with Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and Mean Mr. Mayo as we discuss the Press to Play album. And as for now, because of the coronavirus, the live broadcasts of Every Little Thing will not continue on WNHU until uh, a week from Wednesday, which will be on March the 26th. And that's at 8 p.m. Wednesday at WNHU.org. And that should be it. Okay. And All right. You can contact me, Alan Cozen, at Alan Cozen on Facebook or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, you can contact all of us by email at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter page, which is at Things We Said Fab. And we have a couple of Facebook pages. The um, super official one is Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans, where we um, post links to the shows. And there's also just Things We Said Today, where we also sometimes post links to the shows, but that one we're less, uh, less frequently on. So um, thanks again to Lawrence Juber for coming by and uh, chatting with us, and for Ken Michaels, Darren DeVivo, and myself, Alan Cozen. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Music